Okay, so I think we will start to uh, open our program now, uh, knowing that folks will still be joining. And uh, we want, I'm Elizabeth Boylan. I'm communications manager with the Vilcek Foundation uh, based in New York. Our foundation is a, a nonprofit. We were founded 20 years ago uh, by Jana Maritza Vilcek. And the purpose of the foundation is to celebrate immigrants in the arts and sciences in the United States and to foster appreciation of the arts more generally. Um, we're really excited to bring you today's program, Tradition and Transget Transgression, the artwork of Michaela Martello. Uh, this program came out of a recent publication that we produced, uh, Be a Good Ancestor, the Michaela Martello coloring book, uh, which we produced in collaboration with Pen and Brush. And uh, so we have panelists here today. We have the artist Michaela Martello, and we have uh, Don Delicat, uh, who is the Associate Executive Director of Pen and Brush. Uh, we have Giovanni Benelli, the Gallery Director of Galleria Giovanni Benelli in Milan. And we have Paula Kinsel, who's a graphic artist and the illustrator of the Michela Martello coloring book. Um, I'm going to open uh, with just a few introductions to the panelists and then uh, really let Don Delicat sort of lead the moderation of today's program. Uh, I just want to let all attendees know if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat or in the Q&A section on the Zoom webinar. Um, and we will follow up with you and make sure that we forward on the questions to all of our panelists today. Um, we're really excited to bring this program to everybody. We know that uh, with the pandemic, it's been challenging for folks to engage with the arts. So creating ways to have people connect with exhibitions, with artists, and arts organizations is really valuable. Um, I want to introduce our artist and sort of highlight guest, Michela Martello. Uh, Michela was born in Grosseto, Italy, and she studied illustration at the Europe Institute of Design and uh, worked as an illustrator on over 30 books. In 1993, she shifted her focus to painting and mixed media artworks. And in 1998, she moved permanently to New York. Uh, she's known for her large scale murals and for her mixed media artworks that are characterized using deconstruction and uh, the reinvention of material and subject. Her work has been the focus of many solo and group exhibitions around the world. Most notably, Sulla Terra of the Earth at Galleria Giovanni Bonelli in Milan. And uh, she's also part of the group show at Pen and Brushes in New York, Isolation to Revolution, Rebirth to Dissent. Uh, I also introduced Dawn Delicat, who's the Associate Executive Director of Pen and Brush. She's facilitated many, many exhibitions uh, with Pen and Brush, as well as with other galleries in New York. Uh, she served as manager of Claire Oliver Gallery, uh, managed Ultraviolet Studio in Chelsea, New York, and installed exhibitions at the Morris Museum in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, Pen and Brush, the organization that she is associate executive director for, was founded in 1894 to support women artists and writers and serve to bring women's artwork to a greater audience around the world. Uh, Giovanni Benelli is the gallerist and director of Galleria Giovanni Benelli in Milan, a 300 square meter gallery in Milan's Isola Quarter. Uh, that's dedicated to contemporary art, special projects, and cultural meetings. As I mentioned, uh, Galleria Giovanni Bonelli recently hosted Martello's work in a solo show, Sulla Terra of the Earth, which was produced in collaboration with Don Delicat. And uh, next week, the gallery will be participating in Art Verona's Digital Art Fair. Um, and finally, uh, Paula Kinsell is a motion graphic designer, art director, artist, and illustrator. Uh, she's worked in the entertainment marketing industry uh, with various agencies on projects and with clients, including DC Comics, Warner Brothers, Disney, Universal, and DreamWorks. Uh, most recently, the Vilcek Foundation has collaborated with Paula on the illustration of several coloring books as a means to bring art to people uh, at, during these challenging times. And she illustrated Be a Good Ancestor, the Michaela Martello coloring book, 
uh, which we published last month. Uh, so I will be turning it over now to Dawn to moderate the discussion. Uh, Dawn, I'd love you to talk a bit about Pen and Brush's relationship to working with Michaela and uh, then lead the conversation with Michaela and with Giovanni. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Liz, and thank you to everyone at the Bill Check Foundation. Uh, this relationship has been uh, one of such synergy ever since we met Rick Kinsell uh, back in, I think, 2013 and started to sort of talk about Pen and Brush's work in creating a greater platform for underrecognized artists and writers. Um, so the last with what you all do at the Vilcek Foundation uh, to create such a great platform for amazing thinkers in the arts and liter literature and science um, totally has a great crossover with what we do here at Pen and Brush. So um, we actually met Michaela Martello because of the exhibition that Rick curated. He actually selected out of one like hundreds and hundreds of portfolios so uh perhaps we would have meant anyway and it was meant to be but it was because rick kinsell actually selected her work um when he was reviewing to curate our grand opening uh exhibition for our new flat iron space back in 2015. so rick's vision for that show really uh titled domesticity revisited um, fit in so nicely. Uh, Michaela was one of four artists and Rick was really tapping into um, the vein in contemporary art that tied to, um, you know, the whole history of domestic objects and arts and craft movement and woman was anonymous how so many women throughout history uh, were teaching the next generation through sewing and textiles and items of the home and really training future generations of male and female artists but never really got the credit uh, for that history so when um, Rick really brought together this idea of these four dynamic contemporary artists, Michaela being one of them, um, it was it was with that kind of edge of materiality. And Michaela is um, really a wizard, I will say, of working in every type of media, um, what, whatever the idea is that she's sort of chasing to express. Um, there's really no end to what she will learn and do and adapt with materials um, found throughout her practice and you know art materials to non art materials um, are part of what she brings in so maybe before we get started Pella, I, I chose so we can show the audience what we're talking about a bit. Okay. Can you all see my screen. Yeah. Okay, great. So these are some images just to start of Domesticity Revisited that uh, Rick curated for us here at Pen and Brush. And you can see these are Michaela's works along the wall and um, this incredible textile work that really is about breaking down surfaces and, and bringing them back together. Um, what we often say about Michaela's work here is that she is creating a universal language because not only does she take symbols uh, across religions, across cultural boundaries, it's really across centuries. And on the surface of her canvas, you see contemporary references, um, graffiti art, graphics, mixing, and sort of dancing with um, symbolism across religions. So, um, Michaela, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit how what I like to call your alchemy of doing that on the surface of your works, bringing to together um, so, so much symbolism, heavy content, and really making it digestible and light for the viewer. Um, how does that process start for you generally in your work? Mm. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> and thank you, Vilsec Foundation. Thank you, Pen and Brush. Thank you, Giovanni Bonelli, and all the folks that are uh, here at this event. So um, it's been, um, for me, it's always been like this, working with symbols since ever. I cannot recall precisely how this process starts, but it has to do with the uh, 
um, the effort of bringing together opposites, creating still creating paradox, but working with the, um, so many things that inspires me, but always in the field of uh, symbolism. So it's about um, Oriental philosophy. It's about uh, different kind of archetypes, mythology, um, history. And when I when I feel a particular inspirations towards one direction or another one, I try to merge these opposites into a new language. And um, I, I just recently discovered, and this for me was like an epiphany, I was listening to this Italian philosopher, his name is Galimberti, maybe Giovanni, you know him? I, 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 don't, I mean, Galimberti, but I don't remember his first name. And he was talking about symbol, like the, the origin of the word symbol, referring to ancient Greek, where the, where the, the word symbol was born. And uh, the meaning is uh, uh, bringing together opposites. So for me, it was like, I had no idea. So literally, the, the significance of symbol is un, uh, unification. And that basically tells everything for me. It's like, you don't really know what you're going to uh, come out with, with the new language, but it's, a, it's just, a, um, uh, you just work with the vibrations of uh, symbols that doesn't belong to your culture, but it doesn't mean they don't belong to a universal culture. If I can make sense. <laughs> with these words. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm just going to keep sort of flipping through some of Michaela's bodies of work here for the viewer digest while I um, introduce Giovanni, who we were fortunate enough recently to work with um, at your gallery in Mann for Michaela's solo exhibition, which featured a lot of new work um, as well as some her um, sort of masterpieces throughout her career. So um, Giovanni, I would like to ask how you actually met Michela Martello. Well, um, first, uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar talk. Uh, I, met, I met Michela in 2005. I was a producer of an exhibition, Miracola Milano, organizing an important institutional place in Milano, and I saw the first time Michela works. Uh, since then, I followed her work and uh, her research. I came a few times in New York and I met her in a, a studio, and I like uh, Michela, I like uh, that Michela used. Uh, vintage uh, textiles and uh, decorative uh, folder or Japanese kimono, military sacks, use materials, uh, um, use materials full of, of uh, imperfection that she transform in uh, uh, to our work, fantastic artwork. And uh, I fell in love for uh, her work and I invited her to make the first solo show in Italy. I'm so proud uh, to show um, her work. Um, I invited her in a group show in uh, 2018 with other four artists, very important Italian artists, but famous in the world like Carla Cardi, uh, Maria Lai, Carol Rama, Elena Monzo, and Michela Martello, of course. And um, this show was a, really the first uh, uh, solo show of a woman in my gallery. Um, and I'm so proud. And all the, all the collectors and many artists come to visit this show. Um, it bought a great success for, for me and for Michela. Um, I'm very happy for, the, for this show and uh, um, to present uh, her work in Italy, in my gallery, in a difficult time because the show was between two. Um, two Pandemic. See, two different pandemic uh, lockdowns, uh, two uh, lockdowns, and this is only the the only sunrise that we had in that uh, in this terrible time. Yes, 
So Giovanni, um, you know, being from New York City and uh, sort of looking at other art capitals throughout the world, our experience working with you on this exhibition and, you know, coming there and meeting some of your colleagues and people in the art world, um, my, my impression of what you contribute to the contemporary landscape in Milan really reminds me of the transformation that we went through here in New York City in the 90s when the art world was really relocating from Soho because retail business had outpriced all, you know, the emerging dealers. They relocated to Chelsea and, you know, opened that became the new white cube aesthetic, very much like what we're looking at with your space, concrete floors, bare bones, so that the art can really transform the space every time. And, um, you know, there was a real edge to it, and it was something new. Now, here in New York, it's something we're quite accustomed to. But um, from, from what I took in, in the landscape in Milan, it really seems like you are a bit of the avant-garde dealer, and that is how you are regarded by your peers there in Milan, that you're really pushing the envelope and, and, and breaking forward to bring in art that is, is a little bit different than the normal trend in Milan. Um, so how does th that kind of um, sense that I'm getting of how you are a risk-taking dealer really trying to support significant work that um, may be even a little bit different or shocking um, to the climate there? Uh, you know, how does that match up with the fact that this is, is the first solo exhibition of a woman artist for you in your space? Mi puoi tradurre perché non ho, cioè, ho capito, non vorrei dire per il che, scusami. Eh. No, no, Dicef, I'm going to uh, translate for Giovanni because uh, it's, uh, it was a long... Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm just... Eh, lui praticamente eh, eh, Don dice che la galleria tua gli ha ricordato quello che è successo sì, nel sì. 80 il passaggio da Soho a Chelsea e come se tu proponi un discorso che è abbastanza all'avanguardia rispetto alla classicità italiana e con, con questo spazio che insomma è come se tu fossi visto anche come quello che ha, ha portato uno spazio che può ricordare le energie new yorkesi e sei uno dei primi che ha fatto questo e, e anche come ti senti ad aver fatto uno show, il primo show di una donna in questo, in questo spazio? Well, um, so I told you before, I'm so proud to, do the, to organize uh, the show, thanks to the creators that make a great job with uh, Michela. Um, so I, I don't know uh, if I'm a, a good gallerist, but I believe in what I propose. And, um, and I followed Michela for many years. Uh, and, and when I saw the last works, uh, I asked her to arrange the show. It's the right time uh, to do that. Um, as I told you, uh, we, 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 we made a great show. We arranged a great show of other uh, five artists, women artists. It was a, a great opportunity for my, for my space. And, um, This is the, the first uh, solo show for women. I want to do many others because the, the energy that I, that I saw, the, that I feel, and uh, all the uh, visitors, the collectors, the curators, the artists ca uh, that came uh, to visit the show had a great impression. And so uh, this is only the first of, a, of a many others uh, show. Uh, I don't know if it, If I am a gallerist, but I believe in what I do, and I'm happy to, to, to do what I do with Michela. That's excellent. And Michela, now that you've had, um, you know, you've, you've shown internationally and certainly have had mural commissions all over the world. Um, but for you, now that, you know, you've worked with Pen and Brush um, so many times now um, I'm sitting in front of one of Michaela's pieces that's on view in our current exhibition now, but we did have a, a solo um, eight year survey of Michaela's work in 2017 titled Future is Goddess. So um, now that you've done this deep dive of a solo exhibition in Milano with Giovanni, um, what, what do both shows mean to you as an artist showing, you know, having been migrated from Italy, you're in New York for 22 years now. Um, 
your, your experience showing with us here in New York, what does that mean to you as an artist? And then going back home and having such um, rich coverage and support of your work there in Milan as well. W what has that meant to your career, um, both on the level of sort of seeing where your work will grow to next, but also what it means for you to have that type of opportunity and support and exposure internationally? Of course, it means a lot. It means the world to me. It's um, since I started to collaborate with you with pen and brush, it felt like um, uh, not just an, um, a commercial gallery uh, support, but you. Um, every artist has difficulties on uh, feeling confident about what we do, even if uh, we have validation outside it. So, and what happened with pen and brush, it was a uh, little by little, a serious kind of support, the kind of support that is there, even when you are not showing anything or even when you are not seen by, by the world. So it, it really means a lot to me, the collaboration that I started with, uh, with pen and brush. And then when uh, the solo show came, Future is Goddess, it was really um, way more than my expectation, but at the same time, it helped me to, uh, that's what I'm saying, to kind of feel that kind of confident that it's, it has to do with who I am. And, uh, and it's very simple. It's, it's very simple, but it's also very radical. That's why it can be a little bit brutal, the process of accepting yourself with your talent, with your skills, with your capacity and, uh, and bring together this, uh, um, this energy and seeing that they will manifest in a, in a matter. So Future is Goddess was, was huge. It was really, um, it, it was what kind of uh, brought my, um, me to that point, closed one chapter and opened up a new one. And the new one brought me to, uh, to have a solo in uh, Milano with uh, Giovanni Bonelli. And that was, uh, it's like, you cannot be where you are without your past. So all these steps are, has so much value. And, uh, and of, of course, it's like, it's, it's like we all work together. And when I, when I arrived in Milano, it felt like um, in this such a, horrendous times between two uh, lockdown, this pandemic and the election in, in America. It's, it was really something that I kept pinching myself. Is this really happening? <laughs> and, and also with Don and Parker came in from New York to I Italy, it, was, it wasn't that easy. So it was happening. And uh, it, I felt like a little bit, um, it was meant to be somehow. I felt uh, incredible gratitude towards Giovanni that he recognized my work and he, and even though he's, he's very humble, so he doesn't, uh, I mean, it, it was really, it's very humble and he's very brave because he gave me this opportunity and in, in these very awkward times. And, uh, um, and he felt like, that's what I heard from my friends and colleagues in, in Milano that my work is a little, a little bit different of what you see in Italy. It's a bit of, uh, uh, I, I talk about uh, spiritual things. I, I'm not a con uh, minimalistic artist or conceptual or abstract. Uh, and I come from a uh, heritage of illustration. So it's, um, but it felt like it was needed in this time. It was needed to have this kind of uh, breath and, uh, um, some images that allow us to look within, but not with a dark um, energy, more with the hope in the future and uh, a message that it tells us to cultivate our inner capacity of being grounded and at the same time uh, centered and positive and constructive towards a future. Yeah. Yes, that, that's... Um... Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I was going to say, um, you know, it's we really all feed each other um, when 
when we put opportunity into our artists and writers and the relationship continues, it's really a community that we're trying to build here. And um, ultimately we end up growing together. In this case, this was Pen and Brush's first time curating an exhibition internationally that Giovanni had in invited us to do. So, um, and, and I agree with what you said, Michaela, Giovanni is quite humble um, because, you know, when we're, we're a nonprofit, just like the Vilcek, foundation is, you know, we have um, other means of righting the wrong in society as nonprofit entities. We have we have other ways of garnering funding and grant making that it's not always a direct commercial uh, business one to one where, you know, a commercial gallery may really love supporting under recognized voices or taking chances on something that is not the trend, but it's it can sometimes be risky because we are dealing with just um, the inequities at the secondary level of the art market. And when you're pressing for some some change to open up in the primary market, it, it can be quite difficult um, financially, especially during the time of the pandemic. So, um, you know, what I was really trying to get at as well is that I you know, deeply value what Giovanni did by really stepping out. And it's obvious to me from having spoken to so many of his colleagues in Milan, what he's contributing to the landscape as a commercial dealer, really um, taking an authentic route and, and supporting work that he believes in, even when it is a really difficult um, financial time for businesses and, and for emerging mid-career artists. So, um, yeah. I'm just echoing the the cycle of um, opportunity and moving each other forward and and uh, all of our voices forward together. So we've we've talked about the pandemic a bit, and um, I'd like Michaela for you to take us through this piece because um, this work was actually created right sort of when Italy, you, you had family at home. So, you know, Italy was going through their first wave of the pandemic months before we were, and you were talking to friends and family and you kind of knew the weight of it before it really set in for us here in New York City in March. And um, this, this work produced right after. Um, so if you could just talk about this piece a little bit in detail. Yes. Um... When I started to work on this piece, as you said, I was in contact with Italy every day, with my family, with my friends, and it was like talking to the futures. They, they kept telling me, you'll see in two weeks, uh, this will happen, this will happen. And of course, I, I didn't believe it. But then we all know it's, uh, it happened. And uh, so I, was, I had this uh, um, um, vision in, in my mind since sometimes of this uh, woman with a crown on her head, but I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about a queen. So um, um, these images is uh, connected with the, uh, the Tibetan goddess called Grintara. And um, Grintara, she's a, um, a goddess, I mean, is uh, revered by Tibetans, but also in so many other parts of the uh, world and she's uh, the goddess of compassion and she helps everybody regardless of our origins or our different beliefs no matter what if you ask for help or help she will help and um, of course at that moment i felt like uh, i was experiencing starting to experiencing fear and uh, and I wasn't really able to uh, to be centered, and uh, I kind of uh, felt that I needed to call out for Tara. And um, in doing so, I was also painting this work. So it was a, a big integration with, within my mind, my spirit, and my action. And I felt like that uh, uh, to be in control is like to have Tara within yourself. She's really helping you. So it, I, I wanted to have her on top of this mountain made of dismembered uh, parts of our bodies, uh, like that she's, uh, she's governing this, uh, 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 the situation where we feel like we are a little bit detached by our body because we are too much into our brain, our head, worrying. 
worrying of fears of uh, losing our life. So losing our life means losing contact with our body. And she's, she's in control. She can, uh, she's almost like saying to us, don't worry, everything is going to be fine. I can control these mountains of uh, fear of death. So it's at, at the same time, since she's the goddess of compassion, you feel like that your, your worries and your fears are nothing compared to what's really horrible, like people losing their dearest one, people being in, in intensive care, people losing their jobs. So your worries, if you are lucky enough not to be through all those uh, worst scenarios, are nothing, and you start to um, feel uh, compassionate towards people that are really suffering. Thank you. It's it's such a beautiful work, and I remember um, when we were you know in quarantine and seeing you post this on Instagram for the first time, and just seeing that beauty and grace of of this goddess, but then realizing that her skirt was was made up of human body parts, and then seeing the layers of you painting it on the cured salted meat sacks and what that reference could possibly mean to some of the theories of how uh, COVID started, um, as well as you sort of doing your needlework and threading and, and making it light somehow and digestible um, for, the, for the viewer. So I was really taken by the work. And um, I think this is a perfect segue to um, bring Liz back into the conversation and Paula to talk about how we came um, to create the coloring book on this topic of sort of being in isolation and that um, need for empathy and connection and catharsis through engaging with the arts. Um, so Liz, if you would tell us a bit about this initiative that um, the Vilcek Foundation and Rick headed up with these coloring books uh, before we get into talking about our collaboration specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much. And it was great to hear some of the background into that work because I hadn't known um, as much about uh, that particular work. And that is one of the works that's featured in the coloring book. Uh, so. Uh, as I mentioned in our introduction, the Vilcek Foundation, we celebrate immigrants in the arts and sciences. And another core part of our mission is really fostering a greater appreciation for the arts. Uh, so part of our foundation, we have a gallery space and we exhibit works. And uh, with the pandemic in New York, that space closed. And we were really thinking about how can we bring artwork to people in a way that's accessible to people at home and ways to have people really sort of engage and have their own dialogue with artwork. Uh, Rick came, who is the foundation's president, uh, came forth with the idea of coloring books to bring some of the work from the foundation's collections to the public. And in the spring, um, you know, we moved to put some of our exhibitions that had been planned uh, for in-person exhibitions in our gallery online and uh, created a coloring book featuring a work from our collection with Marsden Hartley, as well as uh, of Oscar Blumner, uh, which was one of the exhibitions that was planned. Uh, as we moved through the summer though, I think we really wanted to think about how we could be using these tools that we had found as ways to bring art to people and to have people connect with the arts and connect with the arts in a way that allowed people to use their own creativity and um, look at art, but think critically about art, uh, whether that was you know coloring or looking at exhibitions online and connect with uh, living artists. And so I know this summer, uh, Rick uh, proposed that we reach out to Pen and Brush uh, having had several successful collaborations in the past, uh, particularly Domesticity Revisited, which uh, Rick co-curated. And as you mentioned, uh, some of McCullough's work had been featured in that exhibition in 2016. And the coloring books were really a way for us to think about how we could be bringing art to people at home um, and how we could also be promoting artists and art organizations more generally. Um, and for us, you know, it's really valuable to be connecting with other partners in the arts. So being able to partner with Pen and Brush and um, 
which has the parallel mission of supporting underrepresented artists and underrepresented groups of artists uh, in contemporary art and in the contemporary art market in New York, uh, while also supporting an immigrant artist. Uh, so uh, when we reached out to you, Dawn, this summer, uh, you mentioned that you had opened the, uh, you were working with Michaela on the exhibition uh, in Milan and that uh, some of Michaela's work would also be part of a group exhibition that you have on view this fall. Uh, Paula, we had collaborated with on our coloring books in the spring. Uh, as I mentioned, Paula's a graphic artist and a multimedia uh, artist and designer. And uh, we've collaborated with her on our previous coloring books and really loved the insight that she brought to the works and sort of reinventing them as line drawings. Um, so I think what was really, I think, particularly interesting for us in exploring Michaela's work in the coloring book and having, uh, working with you, Dawn, and curating the works for the book and uh, working with Paula to examine what works would be most suited to a coloring book format is this idea of sort of layering and the construction and deconstruction. Um, one of the things that came up with that for us was thinking about how do we re-envision these drawings that so much of them is about re-envisioning uh, artwork from around the world or uh, taking different references and sort of reframing them. Um, I am going to see if I can share uh, the PDF of the coloring book here a bit, um, but I would love to hear a bit from Paula and, you know, from, you know, what was your process in starting to looking at these works as an artist yourself, you know, and what did you learn about the works sort of in approaching them for the coloring book? You know, what elements were most uh, compelling to you in Michaela's work in moving towards creating the coloring book? Um, and I'm going to see if I can grab the PDF of the coloring book and share that so we can share those illustrations uh, with folks in the audience right now. Oh, hi, thanks for inviting me to participate in this uh in this chat. I'm, I'm really enjoying it and I, I feel very privileged to be here with these wonderful people, um, very talented group of people and um, to I'm very privileged to be involved with all of the coloring books that Bill Check Foundation has produced. It's been uh, it's been a real joy um, and it's made me uh, I've learned a lot of new skills in, in creating uh, these works so um, I was especially excited about um, working uh, with Michaela and, and recreating Michaela's work for this coloring book um, because, well, for many reasons. First of all, she's the only uh, living artist that I worked with. Um, I, was, I was kind of nervous when we started because I wasn't sure um, whether or not, you know, Michaela would be coming back to me saying, oh, this isn't, this isn't working, this isn't good enough. Um, but luckily, she she seemed to uh, like most of the work that I did. Um, so when when approaching it for the first time and looking through her body of work, um, my first thought was I was so excited because it's such a her work has so much personality. It's very joyful um, and whimsical and fun. And I felt I, I felt like it would make such a wonderful. Uh, group of coloring, yeah, coloring images, coloring book for for people of all ages, especially for kids and for families to um, to experience and have fun with. Um, the The first things I would look for when sort of looking through the work was to sort of try to envision it as a line drawing. Fortunately, with uh, Michaela's work, a lot of it is already sort of based in line drawing, so. Uh, parts of it were very easily uh, translated. Um, but other pieces, you know, you sort of you sort of have to weed through and say, well, a piece that's ceramic won't fit, translate very well, or a piece that has, so much of Michaela's work is painted on found fabrics and objects. And part of the real uh, charm of those pieces is the 
charm isn't the right word, but the essence of those pieces is, is based on like what they're painted on. Um, and a lot of that couldn't be translated either. So there, were, there was a lot to consider when uh, selecting the imagery that we, would, that we used. Um, I remember when you showed us some of the first um, images to share with Michaela and she was calling it a complete reinterpretation that she, you know she was seeing her work in in this explosive exciting other way through your eyes as an artist um which was was really quite lovely to see that exchange start between the two of you um Michaela, i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that um you know i i know you had such a joyful reaction when you saw paula's yeah. first yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. drawings yeah yeah sorry <laughs> i interrupted <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. No, definitely. I remember the first image you sent me, um, the one with the um, 22 tears, the two green uh, horses kind of animals. And uh, when I saw that, those drawings, it felt like it's, that it's even better than my original one. I really enjoyed that. No, I felt like this is amazing. All these, uh, she brought up to life all those little, uh, um, again, uh, human body parts on the background that they, they didn't have that kind of strength in my paintings because in my paintings the two protagonists are the two green horses but in your drawing the background becomes really uh, um, perfectly integrated with the two horses and it, it speaks more for me it was more like a strong even though being a drawing and um, I really think that in each one of those uh, drawings, you, you, it's like you created something that it's uh, you. Oh. So. Well, thank you. I have to say when I first, when um, the, the foundation first sent me the images to work with, I saw that image with the two green horses and I, I didn't look any further. I just started working on it. Like that's all I wanted to do was recreate that image and redraw that image. So I didn't even look through the rest of the work. I just started working on, on uh, 22 tears. <laughs> it was the first, oh, one, yeah. the first one that I did. Yeah. It, it was a real pleasure. I also, the absolute body piece with the, that you were just showing us, mm -hmm. I think was the second one that I did. Um, and I was, I, I didn't know any of the background. I didn't know what your inspiration was for that piece and I'm, um, it just makes it, it really, it, it speaks on a whole new level to hear what you were thinking uh, while you were creating that. It's such a beautiful image. And again, I, uh, going into the, the details of recreating all those arms and feet and limbs that are intertwined to create her gown, um, it was a, uh, it was, it, it made me so appreciative of, of how much work that is for you and your technique is, is mind boggling. I, I, you know, when I'm working on a computer, when I, you know, I mess up, well, I can just undo it and start over. But, but you can do that when you're working on these beautiful images, you are doing it all by hand. And it's, uh, the craftsmanship is, is just breathtaking. And, and I'm so appreciative of what you've done, uh, Michaela. It was a real joy. Thank you, Paula. For me yeah. too. <laughs> I've just shared into the chat. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble sharing the file and sharing my screen um, with the group on Zoom right now. But that's the link to where the coloring book can be accessed on the Bill Check Foundation website. Um, and I th thank you so much uh, for sharing. Um, and I think one of the things that's been uh, really exciting for us was having some familiarity with uh, your work, Michaela, and um, sort of seeing it reinvented in this way. Um, you know, and I think the, you know, so much of what was, what is so unique and so particular to your work is the process of material and uh, construction and deconstruction and how um, you use uh, different recycled objects or sort of repurposing objects and uh, applying different media to them. 
to create the images, you know, and then thinking about how do people reinterpret that uh, when they're engaging with a coloring book. Uh, if it is um, something that was initially embroidery or that was initially done as a uh, piece using plaster or other materials, you know, what does that mean for people to then be playing with the coloring book either in a digital format using uh, Photoshop or an illustrator program to use it as a digital coloring book and thinking about the different ways that collage and uh, mixed media can be applied in that way as well as if people were using um, the coloring book, you know, printing it out and using crayons or markers or watercolor. Um, so that's something that is, you know, really for us was exciting. Um, I also really wanna thank Dawn for writing a, such a beautiful introduction to the coloring book. I think that uh, it really uh, just contextualizes uh, your work so, so strongly and uh, so much of the, how you spoke about the use of symbol and what that means to you to explore different symbols um, and how powerful that is, I think, in supporting artwork from uh, diverse groups of artists. Um, as a woman artist and as someone who uh, grew up in Italy and then emigrated to the United States, um, thinking about how different histories are intertwined in uh, work and sort of become a part of what the ultimate uh, work itself is. Um, you know, and another part for us about sharing the coloring book that was exciting was being able to support the exhibitions of your work, uh, both with Galleria Giovanni Bonelli and uh, with Pen and Brush, uh, both the previous exhibitions and uh, the current exhibition that your work is a part of there. Um, I would Love, I think before we open things up to group Q&A from the attendees, um, I would love Don if you would just give a sort of brief introduction to what the exhibition that is on view right now at Pen and Brush featuring some of Michaela's work is, um, as I know you're sitting in front of one of her pieces right now. Yes, sure. So our current exhibition is um, entitled From Isolation to Revolution, Rebirth to Descent. And it, it really is exactly what it sounds like. It's an umbrella idea trying to give artists space to talk about what's happened in our country um, and in ourselves since March um, th through the platform of their work. So, um, you know, th this experience working on the coloring book and, um, you know, seeing Michaela's uh, piece that was created at the birth of COVID, as well as some of our other artists, um, work that they had already been, um, you know, like, th that's the thing. So, so much has happened in our world with um, having our own mortality sort of thrust at our footsteps, um, quite literally, whether we, you know, at this point, we've all known someone affected by COVID, um, if, if not directly in our own family, one degree of separation, um, you know, but also the fear of it was, was kind of put on our doorstep in a new way that the everyday hustle and bustle of life, especially in a major city like New York or Milan, kind of keeps that at bay, even if we're people that deal in art and, and talk about existentialism every day, it was a different kind of intensity. and. Um, you know, Michaela was working very much in, in her own voice as an artist, but it was coming out um, at another level and another frequency when um, what I call the revolution now happened here in the United States with the murder of George Floyd that unfolded the murders before and unfortunately more that happened after. Many of our artists who really work in that space of, um, of, of really talking about colonialism that still systematically, um, you know, every part of our world blocking opportunity, uh, photographing black bodies, which we don't often see in our museums um, on a regular basis. These are the ways that a lot of artists that we work with work all the time, but it just kind of the level rose up because of what was happening in our world. So we just, you know, being in dialogue with our artists and seeing what they were creating, we wanted to give them space to talk about those things and the immediacy of it, as well as coming into the descent of the November 3rd election 
And l luckily the outcome uh, was rebirth, which Michaela's work behind me symbolizes so beautifully. So um, really we were just trying to create space for talking about the immediacy of the moment through the arts. Um, you know, same with the coloring book, the way that you were offering that connection to people in isolation um, when they needed it so very much. We were really trying to do the same thing, offer an outlet and some, empathy um, on our walls for for people you know now that it became safe to come out at a distance with masks on and actually see art in in space and talk from across the gallery space about what's gone on in our world and relate through the arts um, so I, I think there's a real synergy and intent in how we curated this exhibition and what we did together with this um, coloring book that really is about using the arts and the humanities uh, for, for the highest purpose for all of us to think, engage, um, have an outlet, reflect upon, and hopefully contribute you know, to our society in a, in a better way or a more refreshed way from having experienced and engaged with that art. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, that's really exciting. And the exhibition is on what, I think it's on until mid-December, correct? December 11th. Yeah. December 11th. Uh, so we'll share a link to that exhibition in a follow-up note that we'll send to all of the attendees from today's program. Um, I think as we're getting towards the end of our time, I want to open things up to questions. Um, we have a question from one of our attendees, Ellie Bach, to Michaela. Uh, where she notes the gestures, compositions, and layers in your work feel so intuitive and connected. Do you enter into a state of meditation or dance when you are painting? How does your mentalist state affect the work? And does it change the final image or do you have that worked out before you start? A uh, great question. Thank you for submitting that, Ellie. Yes, indeed, it is a great question. I wish I could say yes, that I am in a state of meditation or I danced before, but no, <laughs> unfortunately I'm miserable. <laughs> Most of the time, <laughs> it's not easy. Um, and interesting enough, when I'm not miserable and when I feel okay, the work is not that good. So now I start to accept the fact that, I, that the process is really hard because it's a uh, it means that's something that is working on a deeper level. That's why it's not easy for me. And um, uh, so when, uh, thank you for saying that it feels intuitive because it's uh, at the end, I can see that, but at the very end, even after days that I finished the work, I can see uh, the connection that are kind of smooth and they almost feels like uh, spontaneous. Um, so it's, uh, I would say that the, the process of uh, making an artwork for me is not very easy. And meditation or dancing, it's always present in my life, but before and after. So it's, um, I wish I, I, would, I would be able to integrate, but uh, not yet. Did I not okay. answer? There was more mm -hmm. questions? Um. I think it was the, I think you covered most of that. Um, you know, I'll ask uh, Ellie if she has any follow-ups to submit those through. Um, I also do want to open it up to panelists. If you have questions for one another that you would like to uh, share or sort of open the discussion a bit more. Um, I think we have another question here uh, asking uh, to Michaela again, you know, were there any particular artists that inspired you to work in the combinations of mixed media that you work in, in combining textile, painting, and uh, mural? Uh, were there any artists or uh, works or sites of work that sort of inspired you to begin experimenting in these ways? Not really. I, I mean, there are so many artists that inspires me that I love, but not because of the um, different media involved in the process. So it's, um, I mean, uh, mostly are the classic, the like Van Gogh, Frida Kahlo, um, Giotto, Piero della Francesca. These are my 
um, icons. I look at them when I when I'm in my studio all the time. I have books of their works, and uh, so sometimes I just uh, look at those images and I feel inspired to create something that is completely different. But I strongly believe that these masters were channeling something something sublime, something very strong that it's uh, is a great source for inspiration of inspirations for us all, not just artists. That's why for me, it's just opening up one of uh, their books is uh, it's very useful. So um, mostly it's Giotto. Giotto is my biggest source of inspiration. And then I look a lot of um, unknown artists from um, ancient Tibet, the one that were creating frescoes in the caves for um, meditation purpose. So um, there are some amazing colors and shapes and uh, uh, the universe of symbols in those uh, frescoes are just uh, magical to me. And, um, and then I look a lot of uh, miniatures, miniatures from India and uh, uh, Afghanistan, from Middle East. Uh, um, um, yeah, about contemporary artists, uh, there are so many that I like. It's uh, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. But mm -hmm. um, multimedia artists uh, now it's uh, well. There are a lot of one. One of my biggest inspirations was and still is uh, Maria Lai, which I had the group show with uh, Giovanni Bonelli because she was this uh, Italian artist from Sardinia. She used to, one of the first that used to work with textile, uh, intertwined with books. And she, not just that, but she was doing an, a, a very um, avant-garde work for her times, especially being a, an Italian woman in a, in a small, uh, a small minded world. She was amazing. And also Carol Rama, another great uh, artist that I, always feel inspired by um, the drawing, the painting that she made uh, were still are unbelievable, really. Great work. Louise Bourgeois, Nancy Spero. Mm, there are so many amazing women that we are so lucky belongs to our, our life, even though they are dead, but they're still alive. Mm -hmm. um. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your inspirations, both from the uh, Western and Eastern references, whether it's looking at miniature uh, Indian or uh, Tibetan miniatures, uh, as well as the work of contemporary artists. Um, I think, you know, you rounded it out thinking about these sort of larger discussions on women in the arts and the, uh, you know, the universe of women in the arts and uh, what power that holds uh, moving forward. So I'd really like to turn it to Dawn to sort of give a few closing remarks and, you know, sort of her perspective from working with pen and brush. And, uh, but just thank you so much, uh, Michaela, for sharing your work with us and letting us engage with you and taking your time and energy today. Thank you. Yes, th thank you all. Um, I, I was also a bit curious, Paula, for you, um, being an artist as well, the way that you work so intensely interpreting and translating these other artist voices in the coloring books, I was just curious, do you find that filtering back into your own creative practices, like ha having been changed a bit through that process? It, it, yeah, unquestionably it has. I. Um... And my, by nature, I'm not a very patient person, and I, and, but this has really forced me to um, spend a lot of time, like really focusing on an individual artwork, which I, you know, on, I've been involved in that being an artist and in the arts my whole life, but I've never spent so much time, like really looking at individual pieces of art and really studying how, you know, an artist has translated this image into this work of art from reality to their vision. And then to for me to have to look at it again and translate it once again into a, you know, a line drawing that reads 
as because often you know when you're the use of colors and shading and you can't really translate it directly into a line drawing you have to sort of reconfigure it and rethink like how am I going to make this read you know as what it actually is representing so it's it's been a real um learning experience for me and I definitely have been inspired to uh to be more creative in my own work and to uh, think more about how how the items that are reality can be represented um, through different mediums and um, it's been a yeah it's been a real learning experience. That's fantastic. I love how um, every aspect of this project has built different forms of artistic communities um, and communication, you know, regardless of our circumstances. So that's wonderful. Um, Giovanni, I know that you have an art fair coming up. I was wondering if you wanted to just um, tell us a little more about it and if there are still some works by Michaela that might be available virtually if anyone in the audience is interested, um, how they can contact you to see them virtually perhaps? Um, the problem is that the, the, the fair is a, is a virtual fair, it's, it's digital fair. Mm -hmm. um, this is a problem because we have now the, the personal meeting, uh, the contact with, with people uh, is very, it's very difficult. Um, we are applied for uh, Mi Art, the main fair in Italy, in Milan, will be in April. And uh, we, we apply with uh, Michaela. Ah. And so we go on to, to show her work uh, um, in Milan, in Italy. And uh, looking the textiles, the vintage textiles, uh, Michaela, and the used materials, I think that uh, she, um, she sees opportunity where others see imperfections. And it takes uh, energy from uh, this uh, material and make a great job. I want to push uh, uh, her work uh, where uh, I can uh, make an exhibition or make fair. I will go on and uh, I'm really, I'm very happy to work with a woman, not, not only Michaela, but others in the future. I want to uh, remember you know that tomorrow is the International Day Against the Violence of Women, and I want to okay. underline this, or is it is important. And uh, maybe I arrive very late uh, to work with uh, uh, women, but uh, from, from now I want to work with most others because they give me more energy, sensibility, feelings. So thanks for your work. Thank you. And Liz, I was just wondering um, if you have any new coloring books that are in the works with the Vilcek Foundation that you're able to talk about yet? Um, so we do have a few in the works right now. Um, I don't know exactly what I am at liberty to speak about openly. Um, I know one that we are uh, actually really excited about and uh, where we are collaborating with Paula again that we can speak to is that uh, in February in celebration of International Women in STEM Day, uh, we will be featuring a coloring book that highlights images of our uh, science prize winners and the scientists at work uh, from the foundation's prize winners cohort. Um, Oh, and Rick, our president, has just told me that I can say all of the coloring books. Uh, thank you, Rick, uh, for texting me. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, we will be highlighting women in STEM uh, with illustrations of uh, women scientists who have been honored by our foundation. Uh, we also are working on coloring books uh, featuring Latinx artists uh, that we are collaborating with Rita Gonzalez from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art uh, to curate a group of artists in, uh, as well as a coloring book featuring Native American pottery from the Vilcek Foundation collection. And we are collaborating with uh, folks from the School for Advanced Research, uh, who we work with in New Mexico to uh, learn more about and better contextualize our work 
uh, work in the Vilcek Foundation collections by Native American artists, uh, as well as uh, working on seeking to develop a coloring book with Native American women artists. Um, so, you know, really uh, moving to celebrate living artists uh, with the coloring books that we are working on. And then I think there's also in the works one coloring book on uh, to bring together a group of emerging uh, immigrant artists in the United States as well. Uh, so a lot in the works and we're really, we've been really excited to see what the response has been to the coloring books um, for people to think about different ways to engage with the arts. Um, I don't want to monopolize anyone's time today and I'm so grateful to all of our panelists for joining us. Um, Don, I'd love if you have any sort of closing remarks and then I'm happy to sort of end it from the foundation. Um, but I just want to express uh, really all of our gratitude to everybody for taking the time, uh, both as panelists today, but also to join as audience members. Thank you so much. Um, when, when you were just running through uh, this amazing roster of coloring books that you have come out and women in STEM to kick it off, it just sort of, um, really made me smile thinking about those images since um, the election and with Kamala Harris being the first woman with a diverse background entering the White House in January um, and seeing those images of like young girls watching the television and her speech and, and what that does to a young person and thinking about these coloring book pages, quite honestly, and and how you're providing tools to, you know, right at an early age, um, engage young minds with um, great achievements by women across the board and diverse backgrounds. It's, it's a fantastic initiative. And I just um, thank you all for your work. I'm so uh, proud to be colleagues with you and have partnered um, in this amazing journey of be a good ancestor. So. Thank you all and, and thank you everyone for, who took the time to attend and listen today. Thank Great. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Giovanni, especially for joining us from Milan. I know it's a very difficult situation there right now. Uh, Michaela, for all of your work and for being for us being able to collaborate with you on the uh, exhibition Domesticity Revisited a few years ago, as well as on this project. Um, Paula, it's, it's so wonderful learning about your illustrations and getting to see your process and uh, visiting all of these works and seeing different ways that we can bring art to the public and uh, having your insight and guidance in sort of reframing these works is wonderful. And Dawn, thank you so much for all of your work with Pen and Brush and really in moderating today's discussion and bringing everybody's voices to the fore. Um, to all of our panelists and attendees, we'll be following up with an email with some links to the exhibition sites at uh, Giovanni Bonelli, at Pen and Brush, uh, to Michaela's website, uh, to Paula's website, and to our coloring book, Be a Good Ancestor, uh, the Michaela Martello coloring book. And thank you all again for joining. Uh, it was really wonderful to speak with everybody today. And we welcome you to email us or message us with any further questions that you have and follow up. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.